the other piece that's going to uh, impact the demand for transportation is efficiency. These, this is my, the miles per gallon, uh, which is the unit, uh, the measurement that's used uh, for uh, car efficiency in the U.S. Um, and, and as you can see, the dotted line is where we are today, or 2010. Uh, and the bars are where we're expecting to get to by 2040. Uh, and as you can see, every country is going to, every country or every region is going to work on improving its efficiency. Uh, and some of it is mandated by uh, government targets. Um, and you can see the various targets that have been set by, by uh, the governments of the different areas for car companies to meet. Uh, we're not expecting the car companies to meet it by the time frame mandated, but eventually we'll get there, and not only that, we'll, we'll exceed it. So this is going to help temper the demand for uh, energy for when it comes to transportation. Um, from a cost standpoint, this is a comparison of the five-year cost of ownership um, for the different types of vehicles. Uh, for the conventional vehicles, the, it, are the cheapest, uh, which is the dark bar at the bottom, the dark green bar, uh, and uh, but their fuel costs are significantly larger. Well, they're larger than uh, some of these other cars. If you take a look at the electric car, for example, the amount of energy that they take to keep operating is the little small bar at the very end on the purple bar, but the purple bar itself is quite expensive. So you're putting in an investment up front and then hoping to recover it over time because of the lower cost of ownership. Not a decision that any of us would jump at and go make today. Um, you know, we probably still want to go for the convention. And so until that bar through better technology uh, is brought, or through uh, economies of scale, uh, you bring down the cost of uh, buying the vehicle and uh, you know, they, then things like plug-in hybrid and electric cars are going to compete better with the conventional. But the full hybrid, on the other hand, where you don't have to plug it in, is only just a little bit more expensive uh, than uh, conventional. Now, this, this particular graph is referring to US uh, numbers, but the trend is going to be similar uh, in most other places as well. And so while y you, know, y you pay a little bit more to buy a hybrid vehicle, and you can get some efficiency back from it in the fuel cost. And from a uh, from a emission standpoint, that's the, that's probably the best intermediate solution, as it were. And a comparison to uh, cost above conventional, uh, you can see. Uh, so this graph on the right compares uses the conventional cost as a base and then looks at the incremental on that basis and the same message is shown over there as well. So some trends in terms of the kinds of vehicles that we are all going to be driving over the next uh, 30 years uh, and uh, the economic drivers that are going to keep, uh, that are going to be behind that. A couple of slides on electricity generation as we showed in, a, uh, in some of the earlier slides. That's the largest sector uh, of energy usage. Um, and it's driven by both the residential commercial sector as well as the industrial sector. And where is this going to come from? Um, clearly, uh, one of the key messages here is that the coal as a sector is going to start leveling off, whereas gas is going to step in and take over. So gas-fired uh, electric uh, ge generation facilities are going to become much more common as coal gets phased out for emissions reason. Nuclear, while today there are some second thoughts about nuclear and the safety and so on, over time people get more comfortable with the fact that you can design a, a safe nuclear plant uh, and we expect that sector to grow as well. Um, Wind is another fast-growing sector, but even at 2040, we're expecting a large amount of the electricity to be still generated by coal and gas, uh, with, with wind playing uh, maybe a 4 or 5 percent of the sector. The next couple of slides, I want to talk a little bit about the impact of uh, the sensitivities around CO2 emissions. There's a lot of talk these days uh, on reducing CO2 emissions. Um, 
I think there's very little argument anymore as to uh, whether human activity has an impact on greenhouse gas emissions and uh, and then very little argument about whether greenhouse gas emissions actually has a correlation to the warming, uh, to global warming. All of that is behind us. Now it's more a question of developing the policies behind how do we control this uh, issue. Um, if you look at each of these uh, energy sources um, and uh, compare the cost of generating electricity, uh, this is the, the y-axis is the number of cents per kilowatt hour that it takes uh, to generate electricity using, say, coal, gas, etc. And you can see coal and gas is still significantly more economically attractive than some of these other solutions. Um, and if you factor in a $60 a ton CO2 tax, as it were, uh, which is that's the level at which North America is going towards. That's where we, we are expecting the CO2 tax to come out around that level. You can see, and I'll go back and forth between these two slides. Oops, not that way. You can see how much coal jumps as a result of that tax. Um, not so much gas, natural gas, because it has lower emissions. Sorry. Uh, and clearly, bars like nuclear, solar, etc., are not at all impacted by the CO2 emissions. So even with a, with a $60 ton of CO2 tax imposed on these various uh, electricity generating methods, you can see that gas, nuclear, and wind uh, are, are much more attractive than some of these other aspects such as solar, solar thermal, or coal. Um, so, as more governments start to impose a CO2 tax, which is a trend that we're predicting will happen, um, the, the shift in terms of what fuel is used to generate electricity is going to change as well. A quick comparison, a breakdown of, of different regions and what kind of fuels are going to be used to generate electricity. As, for example, the graph on the very right for China, coal is still a fairly large fraction, and even at 2040 is going to be a fairly large fraction of, uh, of the fuel of choice. Um, it's plentiful. Uh, the technology exists. Uh, and uh, it's the easiest way to generate electricity, as it were. Um, so even though there may be some concerns about emissions and so on, we don't expect that, at least by 2040, uh, to impact uh, any changes in trends uh, within China. Whereas places like United States and Europe, you start to see the impact of policy decisions, etc., and you can see coal getting phased out, uh, and things like natural gas, nuclear, etc., uh, are starting to kick in. Wind is a big part of Europe. Um, and if any of you all have visited Europe, it's very common to see windmills darting the horizon uh, on the countryside as well as out on the, uh, uh, the seafront and into the sea as well. So wind is taking off in a big way in Europe, uh, less so in the U.S. Um, get natural gas, primarily driven by the unconventional gas, is, is what we are expecting to take off in, in the United States. So each region has its own driving force, as it were, uh, and you've got to take all of that into account to come up with a composite demand. The other key conclusion from this energy outlook is that we are expecting CO2 emissions to naturally plateau out over time. Um, now, Clearly, some of it needs to be, it's not just a question of plateauing out, we need to bring it back down, but even this uh, is, is good news from that standpoint. Uh, even with the growth in population, even with the growth in uh, living standards, etc., we are expecting, uh, with the movement away from uh, fuels like coal, uh, with increased energy efficiency, etc., we're expecting the CO2 emissions to plateau out. On an emissions per capita uh, standpoint, this is another pet peeve of mine. Growing up in India, 
you know, we, you, we were energy efficient, we were recycling well before any of these things became cool things to follow. Uh, we were recycling hundreds of years ago, we still recycle, um, why we now I'm speaking uh, as an Indian. Uh, and uh, energy efficiency wise, you know, it's probably one of the most energy efficient uh, societies I've lived in. Uh, the wastage wise, we, we do a very good job of, uh, of making sure we're efficiently using it. And what I do when I talk to audiences in America is keep pointing out this slide to say, the US has a long way to go. Look at the size of that bar. Uh, and for example, uh, in the US, getting people to use uh, public transportation, shared transportation is a huge issue especially in my state in Texas. The freedom of wanting to use your own car, the flexibility of that, uh, nobody wants to give that up, uh, my wife included. Uh, whereas, you know, growing up in Chennai, that was a part of life, you know, I mean, and it was a perfectly viable form of transportation. Um, so, you know, I don't have any hesitation in using public transportation when it's available, but convincing my American colleagues of that is not easy. But that's something that either through government mandates uh, or through NGOs, through public uh, campaigns, etc., we are predicting that that number is going to come down, uh, but from a per capita standpoint, uh, there's still a big difference uh, between places like uh, U.S. relative to the rest of the world. Now, over time, with the growth in living standards and so on, I'm sure uh, the bars for India are going to rise, uh, and it's reflective of better living standards uh, rather than any kind of wastage of energy. But there's, in my opinion, a lot of wastage in the bar uh, on the U.S. side, which needs some improvement. So that's a pet peeve of mine. Um, so we talked a lot about the demand side of things. So let me spend just a little bit of time talking about supply. So where's all that energy going to come from? A key fact uh, that I'd like to point out is even by 2040, 60% of the demand for energy is going to come from oil and gas. Um, while renewables like solar uh, and uh, wind, etc., are going to grow over time, they're not, still not going to be anywhere close to the, the amount, the size uh, or large enough to be able to uh, replace oil and gas uh, anytime soon. From a liquid standpoint, uh, you know, there's still quite a bit of supply left. As you can see, this is the uh, a prediction from uh, a reputed uh, consultancy organization in the uh, U.S. called IHS um, that Cumulative production, which is the dark green bar uh, on the right-hand side, uh, compared to what else is remaining to produce as liquid fuels. So there's still a lot of liquid fuels left in the world. You, you've often heard of this term called peak oil, uh, that the world as a whole has peaked in its oil production and we're going to start slowly losing. The part that's never factored into that discussion is technology. With each passing year, there has been some new technology that's come in that's made another group of hydrocarbon accumulations viable economically, and it keeps adding to that bar over there. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's common um, statement to make that the world is running out of oil. If, if you, you have to look at it as economic oil versus uneconomic oil, and what moves it from one to the other is technology. 